You want to jump into this? I don't, I don't know if we need an introduction. Let's go. Yeah. I mean, should we introduce ourselves? Uh, briefly. Briefly. Yeah. Who goes I'll first? Me? Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is John Hudson. I'm from KG Tropicals, uh, now in North Carolina, used to be in Virginia. And that's really all you need to know. Here's my friend. <laughs> My name's Jake Adams. I'm with Reef Builders, Reef Therapy, Reef Stock. We do videos, podcasts, uh, articles. Been at it for a long time. And uh, it's actually a, a pleasure and honor to uh, debate with uh, Mr. John Hudson of KG Tropicals today and uh, just really try to shine a light on some of the uh, comparisons and contrast between salt and fresh water. Um, so we don't have an MC, so I'm just going to take a little bit. Just a show of hands. Who here considers themselves a freshwater aquarist? Come on, y'all. Yeah. <laughs> Who here considers themselves a saltwater aquarist? <laughs> so I got an uphill battle. Who here keeps both? Right okay. on, okay. right on. That's good. So um, we were just going to start with some opening statements and uh, just take uh, pot shots at each other until we start swinging. Start swinging the uh, the arms, and uh, but hopefully at the uh, end of this debate, you'll realize that salt water is obviously way better than fresh water. So with that, John, why don't you go ahead and uh, start it off? All right, I got to be honest with y'all for something about something real quick. I had a lot of I planned my opening statement, and I almost feel like I can't use that now because Jake was so nice there. And this was the thing that I was afraid of. I was kind of hoping we were going to get up here and duke it out. And then he comes oh, and says, all Oh, these... I'm just warming up. They're coming. All right, that's the fine. Shots well, then are coming. I will proceed with what I had planned before then. Uh, my fellow fish keepers, uh, the first thing I want to do, I know it sounds like I'm a copycat, but it has to be done. I want to thank Jake for opening himself up to come in here and take this beating from all of you all. Uh, it's got to be all, y'all because it can't be me, because look at him, look at me, it's pretty obvious. But uh, we are, we're friends, we've gotten to know each other a little bit. Uh, don't know each other all that well, but well enough to know I like this guy a lot. But today, I'm not holding nothing back. The gloves it, are coming off, y'all. It, that's gloves exactly what I have written here. The gloves have to come off. I, I respect what you do, and I appreciate you as a friend, but today, you are my foe. Because I'm here to represent what I would call the normal people in this crazy crowd. The normal people in here who don't want to take out a second or third mortgage to buy their next tank. The people who don't like walking around the section that has no lights in this event. The normal people that appreciate being close to nature. Of course, I'm here representing the freshwater fish keepers. Where are my, fish room ke my freshwater keepers at? Yeah, we don't need hands, we just need to hear you. Come on now. There we go. There we go. So, I don't have much more to say as far as an introduction goes, so let's just, let's just go with it. Who, who brings up the first point here? Well, <clears throat> I know there's a lot of you guys out there that keep freshwater. I keep freshwater too. Freshwater's fun and it's nice and it's relaxing, relaxing. You know, it's just something that my grandparents did when I was a kid, you know, they kept some guppies and some sword tails and they didn't have to work very hard, but they also didn't have that thrill, that excitement of achieving and of succeeding, you know, and so there's something to be said for freshwater, but when you want something that's just, you know, a little bit more stimulating, something that's gonna make you learn, something that's gonna challenge you, there's just nothing better than saltwater. All, all three of you, appreciate it. <laughs> Well, unfortunately, to, to come back to that, the, the first thing I'll have to say is something I've already said. You're, you're absolutely right. You can have that challenge. You can have a lot of fun with it, which you better because you're also going to be broke. We all know saltwater aquariums are outrageously expensive. We know you can set up a freshwater tank. I don't care what, for 50 bucks, you can buy a tank off Craigslist, put an air pump in there and a sponge filter. You're good to go. Try to do that with a saltwater tank. It's not happening. Saltwater tanks, all their gizmos and gadgets, yeah, they're all cool, and I personally like them because I like gizmos and gadgets, but uh, I also like having a couple dollars in the bank, and I would never have that if I was to go into the saltwater hobby. So, uh, yeah, they're challenging, they're fun and rewarding, but you're also broke, so how rewarded can you be? <clears throat> it's true that it's not really 
wouldn't be very much fun to have a saltwater tank if you can't pay the bills and the electricity to do it. But come on, be honest, you guys. How many times have you walked into a fresh and saltwater aquarium store and just, just lusted over a clown trigger fish or just a, ye a bright yellow tang? Or John's favorite, the fox face, the black and white fo and yellow fox face. You know that you want a saltwater tank and you gotta start somewhere. You gotta start somewhere. When people ask me, when I worked at aquarium shops that had fresh and salt water and they asked me and they wanted to start, I'm like, you know what? Cut your teeth on fresh water. But you know that you want to eventually graduate to that salt water. You know, the, the colors of a uh, emperor angelfish, um, the patterns of a clown trigger fish, dotty backs are small, attractive, brightly colored fish, a bright pink. You know, so many freshwater fish, there's a lot of imaginary colors going on, right? You gotta have the right lighting on them, you gotta squint at the right angle, you gotta make sure they're in like full breeding coloration. But when you walk into a saltwater fish store or the saltwater section of a freshwater aquarium shop, you see those fish and you wish you could have them. This is why freshwater puffers are so popular. It's a saltwater style fish, you can keep it in a freshwater tank. Yeah, we've all seen the movie. We know why fresh, uh, saltwater aquariums are popular. Uh, we had a show of hands earlier of the people who have freshwater aquariums. I'd like to do a survey real quick. How many, <laughs> Big Rich obviously has his hand up, how many people in this room have been keeping freshwater and freshwater only aquariums for 15 years or more? Now, put your hand down. You, you. Now, my question is, why haven't all of you? He just said everybody wants a saltwater, so if you've been keeping saltwater aquariums for more than 15 years, and that, or excuse me, I'm already bombing. If you've been keeping freshwater aquariums for 15 years and that's all you've ever had, why haven't you moved up to saltwater? It's because not everybody dreams of having saltwater. They saw the movie. I don't need to say the name of the movie, either one of them. They all saw the movie. And I think, I could be wrong, but I think the people in this room took something, took the point of that movie. We all know what the point of that movie was. It's not that it's a cute fish that it was lost and his daddy had to go find him. The point of that movie was that the fish that we know in this aquarium hobby, that are saltwater fish, are pulled from the ocean and put into our little glass boxes. We all remember the dentist's daughter, right? I don't remember her name, but she was the villain in the movie. We all know who she was, and I'm willing to take a guess that most of the people in this room would rather not rip something that has a third of the world to explore and put it into their little glass box. Okay, we love you, Rich, but you're not part of this debate. Thank you. All right, Mr. Hudson, he If is... I get Rich on my side, we know who's winning. Sorry, Jake. John is woefully in ill-equipped to participate in this conversation because I am also an avid freshwater aquarist and as well as saltwater fish. And so he made a great point. You know, there is this notion that a lot of saltwater aquarium animals are pulled from the, from the ocean. And this is true. But when you farm fish in Florida, you know, Southeast Asian fish or Australian fish, or South American fish in Florida, you are actually stealing the cultural resource of the people that live there. Perfect case in point, if most of you guys are freshwater people, Project Piaba is not just sustainable, it is like the shining beacon of sustainability when it comes to pumping resources and money into the environment. So he's absolutely right that the vast majority of, of fish invertebrates and corals in the saltwater hobby do come from the wild. But that just means that you are pumping money into those local communities, those local ecosystems, in the way that P Project Piaba is just starting to scratch the surface, right? Project Piaba is the outlier. But pumping money into the communities and where people come from, where those resources are, that is like what he's saying, he's trying to say it's negative to pull from the ocean, but we pull, it is. We, we harvest thousands of metric tons of, of seafood out of the ocean 
and no one bats an eye. But when you get wild fish from the ocean, you're actually adding resources to the ecosystem in the way that only Project Piaba does. So that's, I don't think that's a detractor. I think that's a, that's a, a positive attribute of the saltwater aquarium hobby. Rich, Rich, give us a break here. Hold up, hold up. We're going to open it up at the end, Rich, I promise. Right now, it's, it's us doing our thing here. I didn't mean any disrespect by what I said, but I mean, again, we all do know it's true. And for me, maybe I'm selfish. Maybe it is, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not worried about what it does. Y'all are gonna hate me for this, but to the environment, I look at it from the standpoint of the animal. And I know I should be looking bigger picture, but I look at, I have a third of the world to explore and I realize they don't all explore a third of the world, but they, I have, unlimited space that I can explore, but now I'm confined to a little glass box. That's more my contention with it than it is hurting, you know, what you're talking about. So we're both right here in my opinion, but I can, I can, uh, I can at least concede that, that I think we're both right when it comes to that. But, uh, I'm sorry, I totally got lost there. I was uh, distracted. You know what, wow, but, you get back on track. I'm on track. I was. <laughs> anyway. You want to go? So there is also not only are the fish being pulled from the wild. When they're pulled from the wild, what has to happen? Uh, what I don't know. This is your point. You well, I mean, it. I would imagine they go through a, a pretty large quarantining process, as they should, to make sure that the fish are okay uh, for aquariums. So they're not going to bring some disease or something like that into your aquariums. Then they're transported to the fish stores, which that's not, I mean, all fish do that. And then they're transported to your house. But because of everything that these fish have to go through, all of the processing and all of the manpower that it takes to collect them and bring them to your fish stores and quarantine them, they're also extraordinarily expensive. I can go to the fish store and buy sometimes on sale 10 neon tetras for $10. I don't think there's such thing as a saltwater fish that even costs $10. So. Not only do we have the them pulling, being pulled from the wild, but they're also, because of that, super expensive for hobbyists. So expensive, wild caught, the dentist's daughter with the, we, we all don't like her, so. You know, John, that would be a great point. This guy is good. If anyone got really excited about wild type silverfish. No one gets excited about wild type silverfish. The biggest, you know, most uh, uh, passionate groups of freshwater aquarium hobbyists. Got your Playco people. You got your wild angelfish people. You got your fancy discus people. You got your fancy plants people. No one's excited about Kabamba. No one's excited about Anacris. We want $20 Bucephalandras. And at that point, you're basically in like coral frag territory, right? So. It's easy to look at saltwater fish, and he has a point. He's true, he's right. You know, by and large, saltwater fish and, and livestock is more expensive. And it's specifically why I have a tank full of green neons, a separate tank full of neons, a separate tank full of cardinals. You can buy a bunch of them for a, a, you know, a reasonable amount of money. But the most passionate freshwater aquarists spend more money on their fish than any saltwater guy, right? Those flower horns. Man, you can't touch a nice flower horns for less than two or three hundred dollars. Black diamond stingrays, eight hundred dollars to start. To start. It's true. Don't, don't even get me started about koi and arowana. And so, you know, freshwater fish are cheaper than saltwater fish, but they're also more expensive for the most for the most exciting ones, right? I keep a lot of zebra placos, you know, and I'm comfortable with that because of investing in, in my aquariums from a saltwater point of view. But that's actually kind of the neat twist to it. <laughs> when you get used to spending a minimum of 50 to 75 to 80 dollars for a decent saltwater fish, you have no problem dropping 100 and 120 dollars for some of the nicer freshwater fish. But just to counter that point, you know, what are some of the other really exciting aspects of the freshwater aquarium hobby? Small shrimp, Small crabs, small snails, small ornamental. Everything that is most exciting about the freshwater hobby is when it starts getting closer to the saltwater aquarium hobby, right? 
Stingrays, once again, because they're saltwater fish you can keep in a freshwater tank. Tire track eels, you know, they're basically a freshwater eel you can keep in a freshwater tank without salt. People get really excited about, uh, you know, mudskippers and all these fish that really come from that edge habitat. Um, but yeah, you know, if you want some really nice shrimp, you want some really nice crabs, you want some really nice snails, go saltwater. They will actually, those shrimp, those invertebrates are going to be cheaper in saltwater than things like, you know, the top of the line, you know, crystal red shrimp or Sulawesi shrimp, you know, so some of the nicest things in freshwater. I, I, point, I made this point previously about the fish, but I'm making a little bit more about the invertebrates. You know, in the saltwater side of the hobby, man, you can get just small little crabs, hermit crabs. I mean, there's just a never-ending stream of hermit crabs to get into. Right? You think, you think uh, cherry shrimp are cool and crystal shrimp and Kong shrimp? Uh, just wait till you start dabbling in the saltwater aquarium invertebrates. Because you know what? You can get a scarlet leg hermit crab, a blue leg hermit crab, a left handed hermit crab for like two to three dollars. You know? So it's not just those high dollar things that you see. Well, uh, and, and you know, once again, we're both right here. We, we see eye to eye more than we think, Jake. But uh, you, I do want to bring up that you. You mentioned some heavy hitters that are super expensive, that, that we all know are super expensive. In fact, if I wanted to make your argument for you, I could give you four or five more that are super expensive and to my, in my opinion, overpriced. But we're talking about like eight or nine fish. All saltwater fish are expensive. Probably on average, I would think more expensive than, than freshwater. I don't have any data, I just go by what I see at the fish store. And I mean, I go into a lot of fish stores that are both fresh and salt water. I don't anymore because John, I'm gonna let you finish. I'm gonna oh, let here you we finish, go, but Kanye, go ahead. German blue rams, one of my favorite fish. You can't touch a nice one for less than 12, 13, 14 dollars. You take a look at a neon blue electric damsel fish, that's gonna be four or five dollars. There is no comparison between a five dollar damsel fish and a 12 dollar German blue ram. There's plenty of fish, for example, Congo tetras, that might cost you six or seven dollars that the males, I will grant, maybe females not so much, but the males are gonna cost about that much and in my opinion will be just as bold. We're not here just to argue about the fish though. I think here we are. We've, we've made, there's a good reason you're 12 feet away. <laughs> it's not all about the fish though. I mean, we can all agree and oh, I, please, I will be, let's steer this conversation away from the fish. I can't wait to talk about not fish. Well, hey, you know, this, this hobby, it, we are all in the business of keeping clean water in a glass box, not just the fish. So I think we can all agree and, and we can all concede that saltwater aquarium fish are amazing. I'm not sitting here trying to dump on them. I win. They're, I win. Let's just let's cl close it up. Shut it down. <laughs> Shut it down. He, he's conceded. He's forfeited. They are amazing. However... Just to add one more thing to the fish, I, even though I just said, let's get away from the fish, I forgot about one of my points here, and that is, I was frequent, frequenting a store in Baltimore, Maryland that's called House of Tropicals. It's the best fish store I've ever been to, uh, and it's unfortunate we'll probably never go there again. This store had about 500 aquariums, and about 60 to 75 of them were saltwater. Now, the fish that were in those tanks were amazing, but I don't know about y'all, I like to walk into a store and I like to have some selection. And if I'm looking over here and there's 425 tanks that I can choose from and the fish are really cheap, and then I look over here, yeah, these fish are amazing, but th there's only like one or two fish in each tank and they're super expensive. And I, to me, I'm gonna go with the one that has more availability. I can try new things, I can explore the hobby and you're gonna have way more options when it comes to freshwater. Did, did you want to say anything about that, or do you want me to move on to the next point and get away from fish? You know, it's true that if you go into a store that has both in fresh, salt, fresh and salt water, they're more likely to have, let's just say, generously 20% salt water. That's because you don't need 500 tanks to find a really nice fish in a, in a full-line aquarium store, right? With a freshwater fish, and you'll agree with me on this, and this is, this is a double-edged sword. You need to put effort into it, right? There's a lot, I, I say they're silver fish, but you can, if some of the best fish, you have to work at it. 
you have to condition them. That's why they're a little bit cheaper. But with saltwater fish, you have that instant gratification. That's why you only need 20% as many tanks or 20% as much selection because the fish you buy is going to look amazing on day one. Whereas a lot of freshwater fish, you got to work at it. But I would say that in most markets, there are way more saltwater only aquarium stores than freshwater stores. You might not be aware of that because you know, you're in your little freshwater bubble and you think freshwater fish are so cool and you don't realize that there's five times as many saltwater only shops. Yeah, and you never see any customers in them either. But uh, <laughs> let's move on. No, 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 I want to answer that one because I worked at an aquarium shop. And then I did too when it failed. <laughs> I worked at a lot of aquarium stores, and the amount of money you can make on just a couple frags is equivalent to helping out dozens upon dozens of people buy 20 hand-picked $2 guppies. This joker just stood up here and said, I only got to sell two things to pay my bills in a saltwater store. I think my point has been made from the by you. From the point of view of the business owner, <laughs> We're, we're in agreement there. No, I get it. I get it. Let's get away from fish, though. I don't know why it has to be me that brings up all the topics and then you I'll, trash I'll, me about I'll it. I'll take it away okay, because I don't ahead. think you can say, I go don't ahead. think you have a good rebuttal to this. You guys ever seen a live coral? There are probably more species and varieties of corals than there are freshwater fish in the hobby. Not freshwater fish total. And the fluorescent colors. There's a lot of colorful aquatic life in the freshwater aquarium hobby. You gotta put these on in order to see them though. But unless you want, you know, a genetically modified mutant glowfish, you know, you really need to go with the, the corals in order to find that real depth and range of colors and patterns. I'm not sure what you can really say about the corals. That's just something that's really unique to the reef aquarium hobby and it adds an extra dimension. Listen, I cannot argue about corals. They are gorgeous. They are a sight to be seen, especially when you have one where the tank is, you know, a good size, who cares what size, but a good size tank and they're really grown in. It is a spectacle. I, I, I cannot argue with that, uh, except for the fact that I just bought a house for probably as much as a tank like that would cost to buy them huge. So that does kind of make the argument for me that they're the expense thing again. I keep going back to that, but you know, hey, listen, we live in the United States of America right now and times are tough and to buy things that are that outrageously expensive and it's just pretty, it doesn't, you can't really watch it eat. Some of them, you can, I get it. And some of them maybe, Nemo will swim around in them and stuff like that. They're gorgeous, but that's really all, that you can't interact with them. You're not gonna, they're not gonna come to the top of the tank and when you feed them and you're gonna pay an absolute fortune for them, so. I'll do you one better. Please I know do. You, you got bills to pay right now. You got that fancy new farmhouse in uh, eastern North Carolina. Indeed. One coral propagation tank of the right corals to the right market will cover your mortgage. It would take 30 freshwater tanks of live bearers and cichlids and Africans and discus and plants to equal the value of the revenue that you can make from one salt water tank. But we're not approaching this from a commercial point of view. I was about to say, show of hands, how many people have their aquariums so that they can pay off their house? There you go. This is an interesting point to, <laughs> to bring up. And yeah, this is not a contentious one, but there are a lot of people, you know, you, you say that saltwater crimes are, are more expensive, but you can get a lot of mileage from propagating some frags, right? Do you know how many, do you know how many freaking cribs you need to bring into the fish store to pay for a can of food that's gonna last you three weeks? You can't even count them if they were evil take your cribs. They're not, they don't even want your convicts. They're gonna give you, they're gonna be like, you know what, uh, here's a sample food, we're gonna use these as feeders, right? <laughs> but when it comes to corals, when you're growing corals, all different types of corals, you bring those in over a medium term, not short term, not long term, or something intermediate, you're paying for your upgrade. You're paying for your next tank. You're paying for your salt in the way that you just can't really do with freshwater unless you're specialized in the discus or arowanas or expensive plants. You know, my next point that I was going to, was I supposed to have a rebuttal to that? I don't think, it's I think you. It's we kind of ended that one, didn't we? My next point was going to be something that I, I, I'm going to choose to skip because I, I don't think it's a very good argument. I was going to talk about 
the fact that he's, he's crumbling, y'all. No, oh, absolutely he's crumbling not. Crumbling in in real time. I, no, this isn't happening. I was going to talk about the fact that we have the extra steps that we have to take. I shouldn't say we. I don't have any saltwater tanks, but one of the things that people come to me and they say, I've thought about starting a saltwater tank. I had this today, but I just don't feel like messing with the water and how to get it mixed up right and all that. I don't want to install an expensive RO system in my house. I just use tap water and I'm fortunate because I can take Fritz Complete and put it in my water and it's perfect for all of my freshwater fish. But with salt water, I would have to spend all of this time mixing it up and I have to buy one of those expensive trash cans that they're wheeling around here. Trash cans, so expensive. Uh, well, hey, <laughs> times are tough, man. Gas is like $9 a gallon. So it's... All of the extra things. It's the RO system that's $1,500. It's the trash cans. It's the having to mix it all up. Now, this is the reason why I didn't want to bring this up. I actually enjoyed that part when I was keeping saltwater aquariums. I enjoyed making the water and doing all of that. But the reason why I was going to bring it up was because I hear it from people. The water's too much. It's, it's too much to have to take care of it. The other reason I'm making your argument for you, and you're welcome, uh, we're all a little crazy with our water and we use crushed coral and we use driftwood and peat moss and all kinds of things to adjust the pH in our water. So really, I'm arguing against myself here. We're all finicky about our water, but I don't think there's anybody that could argue fresh water is just easier when it comes to preparing water for filling up your tank and for doing water changes. I'm really, really glad you mentioned This is why I didn't want to bring it up. I'm really glad you mentioned the water preparation aspect of it because it shines an interesting uh, spotlight. It's a very interesting point that the saltwater aquarium messaging appears to make it more complicated. Now, I, 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 know, I don't want to get in too much hot water, but the saltwater aquarium hobby is dominated by men, by males, and we tend to overcomplicate things. But funny point is, I don't use our water at my studio except on my freshwater tanks. I only use reverse osmosis for my soft water aquariums and for mixing up my chemicals that I put in my saltwater tanks. But I use just straight carbon. You know, I come from the days of the tap water purifier, tap water filter, uh, aquarium pharmaceuticals, right? And I remember being a kid and just lusting after finally being able to save up like $279 for a three-stage RO unit for my discus. Not for my saltwater tank, you know? And so you, when you really get into the freshwater side of things, you're looking at soft water, pH 6, 6.5, neutral community, maybe a little bit more alkaline, 7.5, then start getting a pH 8.0, 8.2 for your African cichlids, maybe some rainbow fish, maybe a little bit of salt for the, uh, you know, the brackish fish or your Celebes rainbow fish or the coastal estuarine fish. What I'm trying to say is if you keep saltwater fish, the water is all the same. You're right. You're totally right. Making the, 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 the water, just making the seawater. Now, you don't have to really use an R unit depending on what you're trying to do. I would argue that there's more water preparation for freshwater, if you're really serious about it, in freshwater than there is in saltwater. But in saltwater tanks, the ocean is pretty much all the same. We're aiming for the same salinity, same pH, and then the only thing that really varies is the temperature. There's, there's a lot more variability in freshwater tanks. In saltwater tanks, it's just how tropical is it, right? And we're all pretty much aiming for something tropical. But in freshwater, if you're really serious about it, there's a lot more uh, parameters to consider. However, <laughs> I'm pretty daggone serious about it. And between my wife and I, and listen, she's on your side over there. So you better behave yourself, because you don't want her coming up here. Don't, you better be nice to She's me. She's going to come up here on my side. That's I heard what I'm saying. Laughing you need to I watch out. <laughs> giving you some zingers. You can make me mad all day. You don't want to make her mad. We take this pretty daggone seriously, and we have, between the two of us, I, we can't count all the beta tanks, because we have 300 of them, but we have about 22 other tanks, from a 360-gallon all the way down to 5-gallon nano tanks. And as seriously as we take this, they all get water out of the tap, including discus, African cichlids, Congo tetras, angels, 
a beta sorority, all of our beta tanks. Now you, Jake, because you are a scientist and a, and a brilliant man, you're going to say, well, John, you're doing it wrong. And my rebuttal to that would be, I do not have a single wild caught fish in my entire fish room. 1,400 square feet of aquariums, not one of them is wild caught. Every single one of them was bred in farms either in Florida or in Germany. And oh yeah, they all use tap water too. So maybe not all the farms in their ponds, but when they have their aquariums that they're raising their fry in and all of that, straight up tap water from Homestead, you know that's what they use. So all of these farms are using the same water that I am, so I don't have to do a thing to my water to adjust it. If I was keeping wild caught fish, I would, and I'll give you that. Or if I'm wanting to do some kind of advanced breeding and all of that and pay off my house, but I'd have to breed a lot of fish in order to be able to do that. But I'm not being irresponsible by doing what I'm doing because the fish that I keep match my water. And I don't, even the discus that were bred in German tap water are all perfectly fine. And, and it's just unfortunate that those discus aren't available anymore because they made this hobby so much easier for people. But when you're picking the right fish and you're getting them from the right place, I don't have to fool around with all of the things to adjust the hardness and the pH and all of that. And that's the trouble with so many prominent freshwater aquarists. They choose the path of least resistance when they know that the trailing fins on their dwarf cichlids will be so much more exuberant, so much more finage when you give them what they need, that soft water. And this is something that freshwater aquarists are just happy to settle for the lowest common denominator for their for their soft water fish, for their hard water fish, and just treat them all the same. But you know you can't get away with that with shrimp. You can't get away with that with an aquascape. You can't just use tap water for the fanciest of plants. And so you know, In a lot my of house fresh we can. <laughs> I'm just for, saying. For your Anubius and your Java ferns. No, we got, we'll, we'll, we'll surprise you in a little bit. It's not all that. Oh, maybe he's got a little Valisneria thrown in there just no. to mix it up. Hey, this is the part where she might come on, up on the stage. I'm not the plant guy, she is. Watch out. See, he needs some backup. <laughs> I do. I've known that all along. <laughs> now, let me just ask you this. If a fish, if the, if the parents that bred the fish were born and raised in German tap water, and then their fry were born and raised in German tap water, those are sold to me. That's all they've ever known. That's all the generations before them have known because they've been adapting them to German tap water for 30 years. What difference is it going to make if I use RO water John, and do I'm all of so that? John, I'm so glad. I'm just waiting for you to ask me that. I'm doing it for you. Go ahead. You see that every question he has, I'm just following it right back. Because the freshwater side of the aquarium hobby, you want to pay so much lip service to biotopes. Biotopes. Tannic acid. Let's throw some, uh, what do you call them? Uh, uh, ornamentals, uh, leaves and pods and sticks, and there's just so much lip service paid to the biotopes. It's revered like some kind of holy aquarium setup, and it ends up looking like a ditch. I mean, you guys have seen some of these tannic aquarium biotopes, right? Um, botanicals, aquarium botanicals, right? There's so much lip service, but in the end, at the end of the day, you claim to care about fish, but you force them into conditions that they were not adapted to grow in. And you don't know what them. you're missing. I didn't breed them. They were sold to me. I didn't, I didn't force them into that. I just forced them to stay in the water they're used to and they've been in since birth. But let's move on from that. Do you have a, another topic or should I move on? Whew, I don't know. This is kind of the hammer drop. I don't know if I should uh, bring oh, this up no, so early. Oh, no, it's not. You might have a hammer drop I got a mic drop coming up, so go ahead. <laughs> you know what, I'll go first. Um, I've already mentioned that you go freshwater to saltwater. You go freshwater to saltwater. You cut your teeth and you end up going to saltwater. It's very rare that someone has a saltwater tank and then goes back to freshwater. You guys would actually be surprised that several, like most of us uh, saltwater aquarium influencers, we all have freshwater tanks. When we get together, we talk about our freshwater tanks and we just, that's not something that we project, you know? And the reason that when you go from freshwater to saltwater is that sense of accomplishment. 
Yes, it is a little bit more expensive. It is a little bit more challenging. There's a little bit more of a learning curve. It's really mostly the salt aspect and just learning a slightly different lingo. But you know, the, the, the higher the risk, the greater the, the reward. The higher the mountain, the more satisfaction in, that you get from accomplishing that peak. Um, so, you know, you can start with fresh water, and I usually advise someone who knows nothing about aquariums to start with fresh water, because I want them to have a good experience, right? I don't want to throw them into the deep end of the pond. But for sure, the, uh, the progression as an aquarist goes in one direction, and that is towards salt water. Yeah, you're in a room full of people that have not, not, not the whole room, but... I just did a survey of all of the people that have had them for over 15 years and have not. I know, but you guys are very excited about puffers and stingrays <laughs> and eels and little invertebrates because you wish you had a saltwater tank. No, they're excited about them because they can keep them in fresh water. But let me tell you, I just experienced something. And, and I, I know you, but I don't know you well enough to know. I'm sure you've experienced this before. And I think everybody in this room has experienced this, even if it's just from one room to the other. I had to move all of my aquariums. Not only did I have to move them, but I had to move them from one state to another, four hours, and that's driving at normal speed. In the U-Haul, it was much more than that. It was the most stressful thing I've ever done in my entire life. Thankfully, I had crazy people like this man sitting over here on the ground that doesn't want me to point him out, lives here and drove from here in his Dodge Ram that gets like eight miles to the gallon to North Carolina just to help me unload my aquariums. Unbelievable, and he bought me pizza today. But I've never experienced such stress. Now, a lot of that has to do with the fact that I moved so far and we have so many, and this is our livelihood, so it's important. But I can't imagine how it would have been if all of my tanks were full of corals. Do you wanna know how it would have been if all your tanks were full of corals? Yes. Exactly the same, except you wouldn't be stressed out because you'd be so much more of a sharpened, experienced aquarist that you would know what you were doing and you would have no problems. You would have ample aeration for everything. The corals do not need to be aerated because they don't breathe like fish. It would be exactly the same, except you would have that experience to know that you're going to come out the other side. I'm pretty sure you were still saying biscotti to your mommy when I start, started keeping fish. So I've been doing this a while. I'm experienced. Uh, you, and you, you were experienced, but you haven't challenged yourself because you've been doing the same thing and forcing freshwater fish into the same water conditions across the board. Again, with so the forcing, I didn't breed these fish. I bought these fish from responsible. I think he's passing the buck, y'all. Well, he's, he's blaming no. somebody else for his mediocrity. I'm correcting you on criticizing me for forcing these animals to do something they don't want to do. And it's not me that did that. I don't feel bad for it at all. I bought these from reputable breeders who through generations have gotten them. Why do we keep going back to that? Is that all you got? I mean, come on. We oh, keep going oh, back you, to that. You want me, you want me to go there? Do you, uh, are you no. ready for me to go there? I don't think so. Go, hey, you can. You're just starting to get a little bit raw. Whatever you, I mean, you keep getting closer to me and I'm starting to freak out a little bit here. <laughs> so close. <laughs> I'm inching closer, y'all. You know, one thing that I think is really important to point out is we've established that saltwater aquariums are more expensive. And one of the benefits is that there's a lot, lot more innovation in the saltwater side of the aquarium hobby. There's things that we enjoyed, have enjoyed for a decade that you guys is, don't even have on your radar, which is unfortunate because there's almost no reason you can't enjoy some of the saltwater aquarium equipment on your freshwater tanks. We were rocking LED lights for a decade before you even knew what the acronym for light emitting diode was, right? And it's something I still don't see. We spend so much energy and attention trying to get the right colors on our corals. I don't see even the freshwater guys, unfortunately, this is sad, being a little bit more critical about the LED lights they put on their aquarium. I remember there was an Aquashella, maybe it was Orlando earlier this year, someone brought a thousand gallon tank with nothing but like platinum uh, aquarium freshwater fish. There was a platinum red tail, platinum marijuana, platinum gar. He put shop lights on that thing, y'all. Shop lights. I saw that one. So you work so hard to grow your fish, to be healthy, to show some colors, and you don't fully appreciate it 
because you're being so laissez-faire about everything. I, I would really challenge you guys to just get a little bit more about critical about LED lighting, right? You do all this work to try to have clear water, to have healthy fish, to grow them larger, but you're really missing out. You know, you need to start looking across the aisle, not even just to fresh water. You go to China, they have a specific LED strip light for goldfish. They have a specific LED strip lights for arowanas, you know? But there's definitely an aspect of trickle-down economics of the saltwater hobby down into freshwater. You know, I know a lot of folks are super hot and bothered by their multiple fluval FX fives and sixes that you have to maintain that still use an AC pump. You guys don't even realize that DC pumps that we've been enjoying since 2009, 2010 are incredibly quiet, incredibly efficient. And the weirdest part, the weirdest part is we've introduced a, a new technology called automatic filter rolls. This came from ponds. The pond guys are way better than fresh and salt water. Like these guys are another level. They are next level. They use automatic filter rolls. It skipped fresh water and went straight to salt. You know, you can get a really dope automatic filter roll that's going to automatically remove the waste, reducing your nitrates. It's completely automatic for less than a Fluval FX, you know, jumbo canister filter. You know, so you need the saltwater hobby and you know, a, a section of us spending more on equipment so that a technology can trickle down to you guys. And I wish you would cross-pollinate a little bit more. Reef Bright, Kessel, Coral Life. Uh, well, it's not Reef Bright, but Lumilite. Uh, these are all names of brand LED lights that I have on my aquariums at home. So I've certainly crossed over. Now, this is the part, Jake, where... Uh, where I have to do it. You thought you had your, your big show ender here. Uh, I'm gonna do it. Uh, please, I, please do. I would say that uh, I was about to divide the room, but you know, there's really only four saltwater people here, so I don't know that I'll divide the room, but uh, unfortunately, I'm standing up here right now about to upset the four saltwater people. What, what, now what? Check. Oh, there we go. See, Zeke doesn't want me to say what I'm about to say. He knows what I'm about the to say. The microphone doesn't want him to, <laughs> to spout some BS. Now listen, I started keeping fish in 1993, okay? I'm an old man. And there's something that I've seen, and I think I'm not alone. Well, I shouldn't say that. I know for a fact I'm not alone here because I talk to people all the time that are in my community and they all pretty much say the same thing. I don't have to get this out of them. They all say it to me. And I kind of proved it. I ran a little bit of an experiment today, and I went and walked through the entire saltwater section because I'm genuinely interested in it. I, I'm fascinated by saltwater aquariums. And what you all don't know is him and I earlier were talking about me setting up a saltwater tank. So as much as I'm standing up here critiquing them, I am a huge fan, and I think we all trying are. Trying to backpedal a little bit. But no, no, no. He's trying to save face. I did this experiment because I kind of wanted to prove my own point. I walked through the entire saltwater section, and I almost felt like every single person over there was turning their nose up against me, at me. I almost felt like I didn't belong. I didn't feel comfortable. Now, listen, I'm not a diva. I'm a YouTuber. A lot of people know me. I don't expect everybody to know me, but... When I go over there, I just don't feel like I belong and I don't feel like I'm welcomed. And the only way that I have been able to describe it, and this is not Aquashella's fault or anything like that, I just feel like it's part of the deal. We're two separate sides. We're freshwater, we're saltwater. And if you're a freshwater guy and you let everybody know that you're a freshwater guy, you don't belong over here. And I don't like that. I can't help but feel like a lot. Here we go. Get ready. Buckle up. I can't help but feel like a lot of the saltwater people are snobs. Not you, but that's how I feel when I walk I'll around in an event like this. I'll take it one step further. Saltwater aquarium people, they're not just snobby to freshwater people. We're snobby to each other. So join our community now. I'm not done. <laughs> if you don't keep the right kind of coral, under the right kind of equipment. Well, you know, I don't know if we can, we don't have that much to talk about. 
But can you blame them? Can you blame them when the freshwater aquarium hobby is so proud of doing things, you know, the same way for 40 years? If I have to watch one more video of some guy who's breeding guppies and live bearers and African cichlids raving about how great sponge filters are, I am going to lose my freaking mind. The biggest sponge innovation that freshwater aquarium hobby has put forward in the last 15 to 20 years is the Matten filter, which is basically a sponge filter with different dimensions. <laughs> so you can't really blame the saltwater hobby the hobbyist, the aquarist, for, you know, just thinking that the freshwater guys aren't trying enough. And on the, flip, on the flip side, we can't blame the freshwater guys for looking at us and thinking we're trying too hard. And I, and I think John and I, come here, man. Are you sure? Yeah, yeah. What, what we really wanted to do with this debate, we weren't trying to win. We weren't, we weren't trying to pull you to one side. We're trying to show you that there's a lot more overlap and we sh this is my favorite part of Aquashella. I don't come here for the corals. I don't come here for the saltwater people. I come here to rub elbows with, you know, people who are just into all kinds of different things. Who here has ever heard of Bucephalandra? Small flex. I was the first person in the United States to grow Bucephalandra because my saltwater aquarium experience had me looking for cuttings, cuttings of corals, cuttings of plants. And it was that cross-pollination that was just like, oh yeah, I can totally just grab this plant from Hong Kong, $100 from one tiny little piece. You know, but that's how it starts. You know, sometimes you need hobbyists to push the uh, aquarium hobby, the, the, the aquariums, and sometimes you need aquarists to push the hobby. One of the things I haven't, well, I kind of talked about it in a video one time, but the reason why this is happening here right now. I told you the way I feel. I feel like we're divided. And, and I don't like that. I don't like that at all. I, I want us all. The divisions are within the aquarium hobby. Well, and, and Angel fish saying. people don't talk to discus people. Oh, yes, they do. Are you? How dare you? <laughs> Malawi people don't talk to Tanganyika people. Sure. I don't know where this guy lives, but you in know my world, I'm right. we do. You know I'm right. You cannot mix Malawis and, and, and Tanganyikans in the same tank. If, that, if that's true... Uh, then the problem is bigger than just saltwater versus freshwater. But I've felt this way forever, and I think a, a majority, I think everybody in this room, whether you are saltwater or freshwater, you, you feel it. You know that there's a division, and I want to stop that. And something absolutely beautiful happened to me on, in Halloween last year in Houston at the Aquashella. I'm not used to saltwater people having any interest whatsoever in talking to me. I, I'll approach them, and, and they kind of turn their back, and I just don't feel welcome, and it, it feels uncomfortable. But I had something miraculous happen to me that's never happened to me in my, I don't do math, a, a lot of years of fish keeping and coming to events like this. I had a guy approach me. Now, it was kind of funny because this guy is like 6'5", and he was wearing a giant Bob Ross wig. And he was wearing the denims, and he was carrying a palette that had corals on it. I just, that's what it's called, right, palette? It was adorable. And this guy walked up to me and said, I like what you do. And I said, what? Because I knew this guy was a saltwater guy. I'd seen his aquariums, or not his aquariums, but his videos. I knew who he was. I'd seen him up on this stage talking. And I was like, How, why, who, who, why is this happening? But that right there led me to believe that even if it's one at a time, we can bring this whole hobby together. We can stop being divided. There can be coral dealers over there and angel breeders, freshwater angel breeders, over here. This can be an aquarium convention instead of sliced down the middle and, and being separate like that. And uh, oh, by the way, in case you didn't figure out, that guy that approached me in Dallas was this guy right here. And it meant a lot to me. I want to thank you for that, even though it was just, hey, talking to a guy, it meant more to me than you know because it was the first time that's ever happened to me. And I think that needs to happen more. I, need to, I think it needs, all of us need to do that from both sides. And, you know, in this room, <laughs> the four saltwater people are going to get bombarded, but I think that needs to happen. I think we all need to understand at the end of the day, we all fill up glass boxes full of water. We're all the same, and we need to all 
act like it. I'm, I'm not going to carry on and on, but I just want you to know that if you're really passionate about any hobby, any pastime, you want to look just right next door to your neighbor, look across the aisle. I mean, look at this logo right here, right? This is what it's all about. This is one thing that's really unique about Aquashella, is bringing fresh water together with salt water, you know? And so I come to Aquashella to rub elbows with everyone. I really encourage you to, to, to at least peruse the saltwater sections and the reefers to peruse the freshwater sections because as different as the aquarium hobbies seem to be, you know, it, we're... Like he said, we're all keeping water in glass boxes, and there's a lot we can learn from each other. You know, the biggest development in the saltwater aquarium hobby in the last handful of years is automatic filter rolls, which came from the pond side of the hobby. And believe it or not, I was given talks about using super glue to glue down epiphytic plants as far back in 2009, 2010, when the freshwater guys didn't even believe me. You know, so there's, you can skip the line. It took Seachem 10 years to provide the first freshwater labeled super glue. But there's a lot we can learn from each other if we, if we tear down these walls and stop pretending like we're not all keeping aquariums. So it, I think this is one of the rarest uh, presentations I've ever given, the only second debate ever, but it, I can tell from the silence that you guys are actually paying attention, except for that guy who's asleep. But <laughs> John, thank you so much, man. This it was is, a pleasure. It's it been was a, a lot really of fun. fun experience. Thank you all for letting us do this. This was a blast. Do we, do we want to go over and just take any questions or anything? Uh, we Are we allowed? A little bit, but before, before we take some questions, I'm a show organizer. I've been putting on shows since 2008 in Denver and in Australia. If you see someone, anyone, that's part of the staff of Aquashella, tell them how you felt about this talk. Tell them how you felt about this show. They work for nothing. They work for a room. They work for a meal. You know, a little bit, of, a couple, couple of pennies to scratch together. But if you have a chance to thank somebody who's organizing the show, please stop them, whatever they're doing, and tell them how much this show meant to you. If you have any questions or if yeah, you want to dive in. We might in. be able to do a couple if you have them. Yes, ma'am. I had a question. Let's hear it. So when, at first, you told us how, how freshwater fish, you only need $50, but in your video, Aquarium Suck, you told us, <laughs> you told us that you need like $200 if, like, you, like for those starter kits are, that are $50, you also need to buy the decorations, the sand, the rocks. And he told us it's $200. Like, That's true. Like I it. mean, we got a smart one here, ladies and gentlemen. That is very, very true. And, and thank you for calling me out. Uh, the thing is, there's a lot of different ways that you can do this. And you can absolutely set up an aquarium with everything in it, with your SpongeBob pineapple and a couple of fake plants and all the rainbow gravel and all of that. And you can do that inexpensive, inexpensively, maybe even for $50, if you're willing to put in the work to find it. Through things like Facebook Marketplace and stuff like that. One of the things, I'm sure you can back me up on this, that I've learned is when people decide they want out of this hobby, they want out now and the tanks that they're having in their house are taking up space and they'll take just about anything they can to get them out of their house those are the people that you have to look for and find and you can find that fifty dollar gem and you can get started but what i was talking about in that video yes was two hundred dollars um and that's the ideal situation but you can go in a lot cheaper i would even say cheaper than fifty dollars if you're willing to put the work in to find it yeah, I mean, the, 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 however much you spend or if you save money, if you cut corners, some of that is going to have to be made up in elbow grease. And, you know, it's, it's easy to look over at the saltwater side and see, like, a saltwater uh, aquarium setup that's three and a half thousand dollars that's middle of the road that doesn't give you that doesn't get you lights that doesn't get you any livestock that doesn't get you new water but it doesn't have to be that way it's because we've put up these artificial barriers that salt water has strayed towards this hot rod you know muscle car kind of mentality regarding aquariums but on the same 
token, Freshwater is like, okay, how cheap can we make it and how many corners can we cut? And I feel there's a lot of daylight to make saltwater tanks more affordable and to make freshwater tanks just a little bit more enjoyable by not just you know, trying to save pennies on, on your heater or something like that. Absolutely. And bravo to dad who's raised a little girl that is willing to stand up and say, hey, that's not what you said before. Uh, thank you for that. I appreciate it. Anybody else before we get kicked out of here? Speak, yes, speak loudly. Uh, uh, okay. Jake's picking. Hopefully the question for Jake. Uh, it's for both of you, actually. Okay. So one of my favorite things, having a wife in the aquarium hobby. Speak louder. Uh, so one of my favorite things, having a wife in the aquarium hobby, is that every week she'll come up with some crazy fact, either salt water, fresh water, whatever. You know, bichers have lungs, they can live on land. There's walking dendros that have worms living in them. What, could each of you share your favorite salt water uh, life fact and fresh water life fact? He went deep on us, Jake. Wow. Yeah, so I think he's just asking us, you know, for kind of a, some cross-pollination of favorite facts. Um, I'm a huge fan of mudskippers. I'm a huge fan of fish who think they don't belong in water. But I think you know about mudskippers enough. I was recently in New Caledonia and I got to walk through a mangrove park. Imagine a park of trees, except every tree is a mangrove and there's mudskippers right there. But I think even really cooler than that is a lot of the Pacific Island um, uh, rhinogobius, uh, the, the, the little blennies that, 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 that they're, sorry, gobies that go uphill, they go up little waterfalls. And the waterfalls are, you know, they're like this tall, but when the fish is this big, it's the same as like scaling a mountain. And so I really love uh, some of those uh, kind of Pacific Island freshwater gobies that descended from saltwater fish. I think they're just incredibly fascinating. And they're really cool because the males will exhibit a very saltwater uh, trait, is that when they're nuptial coloration, boom, all of a sudden you have like saltwater colors in a freshwater fish. But it goes back to that risk reward thing. The fish can be, you know, a little bit they're, they're affordable. They're not the, the cheapest freshwater fish. Um, but, you, you know, you'll get them and they'll look kind of neat, but you have to know where they're going with their, their pattern and put the effort into uh, uh, get them really colored up. So I love me some mudskippers, but like the rhinogobius that, that go upstream, I think they're just incredibly fascinating for their life stages. I'm not really sure how to answer the question, uh, but I think... This is going to sound like a cop-out, and, and that's fine. But I think the, the coolest thing to me when, with both freshwater and saltwater is the fact that we have events like this. I started keeping fish in 1993, and there was no such thing as a bunch of people getting together, at least not that I knew of. It was only the, uh, like a one club that was focused on one thing. Well, yeah, and like killifish or cichlids or you had discus. to know somebody who was related to a guy who used to date that girl that knows about that club. I mean, I didn't know of anything like that, so I was never able to uh, to gather with people that are like minded and interested and willing to ask questions like that that I don't know how to answer. I think it's a beautiful thing, and so uh, to me, that's that's my favorite thing about. Uh, and that's probably not what you were looking for, but. <laughs> but also as a little throwback, um, when I was younger, one of the first tanks that I had was a 55 gallon Malawi African cichlid tank, and it had a mono in it, a mono. Do you, do you know where this is going? Then I set up a saltwater tank, and I took that mono, and I put it in the saltwater tank, and that was just, just mind blowing that you could have the same fish in a freshwater and saltwater tank. I have had so many monos in my display saltwater and like reef tanks at stores I worked at that the managers would get mad at me because it wasn't a really colorful fish. But you know, so this is one of those things that kind of embodies what we're trying to get across as far as the cross pollination. We had a question over here. I think we could do one more. I th we had one more over here too. So we'll go with those real quick, and then you got to make the run. I'm I'm old. I'll take this one. <laughs> hello, hello. Hi. So I think what's interesting about this is it's really not even fresh versus salt. You're talking about almost commonality or simplicity in making a hobby easy versus complexity and almost fine tuning. Like you said, kind of making it like this hot rod hobby, right? Um, I think that's really what's more interesting is because you're right about freshwater. Like in my home, I have very hard water. 
I can't grow like a Monte Gracilis. So I, brought, I bought an RO machine so I could now remineralize water. So like that's just as complex as salt water. But on the other hand, I've had a crazy six months. My high tech CO2 highlight tanks have become a huge pain in the butt and I really would have liked to have like a 40 gallon breeder with a sponge filter that I didn't have to go dedicate five, six hours a week to all these crazy high tech plants. So what's funny is like, as I'm listening to this whole thing, I'm like, this isn't even fresh for salt. This is almost like time management or uh, yeah, or a hobbyist versus enthusiast. So, yeah. Absolutely. We had one over here, didn't we? Yes, sir. You weren't looking for any kind of response, right? I mean, that was... I don't know what's check, check. One response is that, you know, um, I've had a planted tank that was like super high tech. It was a planted tank that was set up like a reef tank with a, a CO2 uh, gassing chamber, which some people are trying to act like that's some kind of new thing. Um, but it was a lot of work. Every two weeks I had to get in there and it was really um, meditative to, you know, trim the plants. But if I didn't get in, if I missed a single week, then the, the plant growth would just uh, you know, smother everything underneath it. So you're actually kind of right that there's less of a converse, uh, of a debate between fresh and salt and more of a difference between the high-tech, more involved aquariums and the low-tech, uh, you know, hands-off aquariums. So just commenting what you said. One more? Yes, sir. So my wife and I have too many freshwater tanks, no saltwater tanks, and I've had an interest. Your hand if you have too many freshwater tanks in here. You're not alone. Come on, get those hands up. We all have too many freshwater tanks. So I've always had an interest in saltwater tanks, but we don't have a fish route. We just prefer having fish tanks scattered throughout our house and our living quarters so that we can enjoy them no matter what we're doing throughout the day. But one of my concerns is I don't want my entire house filled with blue light. Uh, so what would you advise somebody who would want to start with some saltwater tanks but don't want to have blue light everywhere in their house, if that makes sense? I think this is a great point to end on. And John and I will be around and uh, available to talk to you guys one-on-one -on -one as time uh, uh, allows. Um, but just like, just like fresh water, there's certain saltwater trends that are dominating and the vendors are doing what they think they need to do to appease their customers, right? And so one of the beauties of a, any controllable LED light, not just saltwater, is you don't have to be blue. Every light worth buying nowadays is gonna be have some kind of control. So all my reef tanks, all my saltwater tanks, they start out really blue and they naturally ramp up to a very daylight coloration and then they ramp it back down to blue. Same as my planet tank. My Kessel Tuna Sun starts off, you know, very reddish, very orangish, then goes to full daylight and then back to orange. And so I know you come to the events and you see this like hyper blue light and by and large, you are gonna see a lot more bluish white light. There's nothing that says that's what you have to do. You know, if you want a, a good, uh, kind of time frame of when the freshwater and saltwater hobbies were probably a little bit more, you know, cross-pollinating. Like, open up some magazines from like mid-2000s up to about 2010s. The tanks weren't all blue then, right? I think right now we're just getting high on how blue we can get our tanks because we have all these options. But that pendulum is going to swing back the other way. So I wouldn't say that's not a prerequisite. I have tanks that stay very white. Uh, my saltwater fish tank is always very white. If you put blue light on your saltwater fish, they're not going to look that awesome. You know, so what you see out there is just, you know, a trend. And it's not permanent and it's not obligatory. But John and I want to thank everybody here for entertaining. Yeah, let me say something real quick. Most of you that are in here are freshwater fish keepers. You know the name Dean Tweedale, right? We all know that name. He came up to me earlier. Was it, was it yesterday? I don't know. And he said, John, if you lose this debate, you are kicked out of the freshwater community. You're no longer allowed. But I wasn't able to tell him then, and I hope you all figured out, that this, like Jake said earlier, this wasn't about winning or losing. Yeah, we had fun and we looked like we were mad at each other, but it was absolutely for fun and to try to bring everybody together. And I want to thank you all for letting us do that. You close it out for us, Jake. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, everybody.